going to show us like a five, four, three, two, one. Hey, it's Kevin Eastman, San Diego Comic Con 2020. Uh, we are so excited that you are joining us here. Um, I guess, you know, the first thing I want to say um, is probably painfully obvious for everybody that's going to be on this panel and all the people we're talking to is that there's nothing we would like more um, than to be sitting in a room full of people with all of you wonderful, awesome people um, uh, joining us in banter. We, we, we miss the love. We miss the camaraderie. Um, we're probably the biggest geeks and fans of any of you guys out there listening to us. And uh, we, we do miss you. And uh, we'll all take solace in that um, you're safe and sound and happy and healthy and uh, getting ready to all come and see us next year and hang at the next panel. So um, appreciate you. Love you. Um, keep the faith. Um, so with this panel, um, we want to do a couple of fun things, um, kind of cover a little um, bits of cool history, I guess, that happened since the last uh, San Diego Camel Con panel, uh, 2019. And then we're going to get into some of the things that uh, evolved out of 2019 that are taking us through this year. And sort of general plans of what we're doing through all things Turtles and Kevin Eastman Studios and, and whatnot. But the uh, um, first thing I want to mention is when we were doing the panel in 2019, we were still uh, hmm, how many issues away were we, Tom, from issue 100? <laughs> um, were we in the 80s by then? I think so. I can't, I can't even remember. Well, it's like because um, issue 100 came out in uh, December. Um, and so I know we had been on the road to issue 100 um, since, well, you know, for 10 years, nine and a half years. Um, but, um, you know, starting in January 2019, it was just a sort of continuous sort of like, oh, here we go, here we go. We're making sure we hit every beat and uh, working with so many um, incredibly talented artists. And Bobby Carnot, we just have to give the biggest shout out to uh, the greatest series um, editor of all time. He really was um, just a, an amazing and important part of the whole construction of everything that led us down to that. And all of our friends at Nickelodeon, of course, um, who supported everything we did. But um, as I mentioned at uh, the panel last year is uh, one guy um, was responsible for writing all 100 issues. And now I get to say it officially because then he was still writing them, but he wrote all 100 issues <laughs> of the Turtles. It is Tom Walls, my brother, I'm your biggest fan. Um, you know, what does that feel like? I mean, you know, and I, I want to point it to you because it is, it's epic. It's groundbreaking. You know, not a lot of people do that. 100 consecutive issues, bro. Crazy. You know, it's funny. It's like, and you're talking about like Comic Con. Now to think about it, I think what we were excited about at Comic Con was the re we revealed Jenica as the the yes. fifth female girl. So that was the big news at Comic Con. And so what's funny now, I think I've said this many times, doing the hundred issues when I was in the middle of it, it was hard to think about because it was just felt like one long writing session for ten years, <laughs> but. But it was one of those things where just when you're in the thick of it, all you're thinking about is the next deadline and the, the next the next arc, the next plot point, you know, the, 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 the next reveal. And so you don't, it, it doesn't really hit you because you're always in the middle of it. And I think even then thinking about how we couldn't wait to reveal Jenica, it's funny now to look back on that because now the whole world knows Jenica. She's had her own mini series. She's, you know, she's, she's played a huge part in, in this post 100 era of the Turtles. So it's funny how just time flies, but now being outside of it, I can look back on it now and it seems, it seems amazing to me. I mean, not just my part, but the entire team that we stayed together that long, that we told the story we wanted to tell. And it just feels funny now to look back and, and, and not every day be waking up thinking, okay, what, what's, I mean, besides the other projects we're working on, but as far as the ongoing, not having that, as, as part of my life. So that I think the full gravity of those 100 issues kind of sets in more now, you know, in retrospect, looking back on it than it did during it. So I'm very proud of it. And it was something that, that, that I, I always laugh because my brother-in-law is a big comic book geek. And way back when I started my writing comics, he said, do you think you could handle a monthly comic? Cause I was, you know, I was writing small mini series. Like I had a creator own book called, Children of the Grave, and that was four issues, and you know, so they were just kind of like these standalone little mini series. Do you really think you could handle a, a monthly comic book? Seems like it would be be something with your schedule that would be hard. And I said, I don't know. I'd like to give it a shot. So I like to think I proved I can. <laughs> but, but 
but now it's funny because now we're you know we're, we're working on the new projects that we'll talk about and it's it's you you have a groove for 10 years then you step back for a little bit now i'm having to find a new groove and it's it's funny you would think i would just jump in like getting on a bicycle but it's it's a different feeling this time because i think that was my life and now you step away and it's like okay i gotta i gotta get back in it's kind of like an olympic guy i guess in the olympics you gotta get back in the gym and get training and some things are you know a little stiff and you gotta work them out but but i'm excited and like i said i'm, I'm glad we did it and, and i'm very proud of it but i was just part of a of a, of a team that that saw it through and, and i mean that's you obviously and and, and our editor and, and co-plotter bobby kernow and and sean lee our letterer and Rhonda patterson who was on every issue coloring um and many great artists so well, yeah, I'm just happy to be part of it well, you know, as I say, it takes a village, but it does also take a, a leader to, to, to take it all the way home. And I, it's just funny because, um, you know, over the years that we've done these panels and done these talks and been out there, I've, you know, all the conventions I've been to and that kind of stuff, it is sort of one of those things that um, all the things that we set up or that were set up is like, well, here's the first 12 issues. If we make it through 12, maybe we'll get another 12 and you, yeah. I'm stealing quotes from you. And then it was sort of like when you could sort of eyeball and you could see 50 on the horizon, you go issue 50 said, Holy smokes. If we get to issue 50, then by the time you get to 50, which is fascinating to me because that's where um, some of your ideas like planting the seed of Jenica in issue 51 and things, how that evolved, like all these things that were noodled about and thrown about and talked about through different uh, mind melt sessions and just sort of, yeah wish list, wish list that, and then uh, as it sort of steadily evolved towards uh, issue 100. And um, yeah, it's been such an exceptional journey. And I do think that, um, uh, you know, I've told many of a fan when uh, we do our shows and I do my presentations that I feel like this particular universe, I call it the IDW Tom Waltz universe is the definitive comic universe and definitive even I think beyond that. But I feel like it strung together so many amazing parts of so many tour universes um, into one singular platform with enough um, idioms and nuances to tell so many fantastic stories and bring so many fantastic uh, characters in and out of that story. It really, to me, feels like, um, you know, again, Eastwood and Laird, you know, um, Ron, you know, set that aside, but this is um, the definitive turtle universe, in, in my opinion. And even Ben was part of this silly oh, yeah. Yeah. universe in many ways. Besides the covers, we did a What's that little project we did called? Um... Yeah, my, I jumped on on, 50, on 55 for my very first turtle cover ever. Um, I think it was my first mainstream published work. Um, and I got it just by being a super fan and drawing fake covers and bothering Bobby and Tom <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and then it's funny, I got it, you know, like without Kevin Eastman and then Kevin and I came together separately for other stuff, which we'll talk about. Um, but yeah, then we, uh, came together for Target R, which is obviously one of my favorite turtle stories ever. Um, I like to say it's the angriest Raf has ever got. It's the Raphael Macro series. And uh, first time I really hung out with Kevin at length was at his house the last night of San Diego Comic Con a few years ago. And and he's like, what do you think is like the, the bet, like what turtle story would you want to tell like more than anything? And I was rambling on about like one night out with Casey and Raf and most of it's like inner monologue, different colored you know, narration boxes and whatnot, and they're just beating people up, but doing it for different reasons and in different ways and different things on their mind. And he's like, I got a story kind of like that. And then months later, Target R uh, reared its angry head. And um, and we did that. It was big. It was like 48 pages. It was a big, uh, big thing. Well, it, was kind of, it was a neat idea. And I think it, um, Tom, did that evolve out of just um, some editorial discussions? Or does it seem like, you know, the idea of doing one of those one shots featuring each of the turtles where they were at that time as we rolled towards the end of 2018 as it leading into 2019 yeah. was it seemed like you wanted to sort of you guys were teeing up you know what was going to be happening with them as a sort of a look to the future yeah i think the the second macro series that included tarkar also had a, a another purpose and that was after all those years of writing we had had such a huge ensemble cast that yeah. one of the things bobby was getting worried about was that hey we don't want the turtles to get lost in their own book because we had so many side characters and, and supporting characters, villains and allies that were really, you know, stepping to the forefront and that were very interesting and, and integral to what we were doing. But it's the book's called Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Bobby said, "Let's let's make sure we get the turtles out there right now 
front and center in their own book. So, you know, fans know we, this is important to us that they are the stars and that we, we haven't forgotten about them. And I think, you know, that, that was part of the reason we did it, but also because the story was just so big, you know, we couldn't cram it all into 20 pages every month that we needed, we needed something to do. And I, and I know you came in, you know, we reached out to other writers to kind of pitch their ideas for their stories for the other three turtles. But this one, I know it was germinating in your mind and you said, Hey, maybe this is the opportunity now to tell this story and find a way to, to fit into the overall plot. And, and it was great. I mean, it was, and, you know, I got a chance to kind of help you guys out with that one a little bit, but I was, uh, I was really excited because one of the things you do so well, and, I, and it's a storytelling device I like is kind of this, this chronological, you know, moving back and forward in, within the story itself. And I think it's, it's fun. It's exciting. I think that's fun storytelling. It, and it keeps you on your toes as a reader, you know, and, and, and keeps you paying attention. And this one was, I think, probably other than our very first annual, which was bonkers chronologically all over the place. This one was uh, so well done, both between you and, and Ben's artwork. You never get lost, even though there is, you know, this time shifting happening. It was super non-linear. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Ben. Well, I was just saying it was super non-linear, which um, that's how I write for myself, too, which I'm used to doing a lot of stuff on my own. And, and so I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. I get it. But then I would get roughs from Kevin because uh, he did all the layouts and the roughs and the uh, and I was like, where are we? When are we? And then I would have to like kind of put the script together with obviously the roughs. And, and I was like, oh, I get it. This is cool. Like, <laughs> I love that. I love that kind of storytelling. No, I think it's, 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 I enjoy it. And it does, I sort of sometimes get lost um, in the forest, um, despite the trees sort of, but I do remember like the 2012 one that Tom mentioned was, uh, I had this idea and I had this huge grid of what I wanted to do, this sort of Guy Ritchie sort of heist sort of whole thing. And uh, <laughs> I think it was like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Um, but Tom helped me figure it out and, and make a sensible story out of it. So that was the same with Target R is that uh, my idea was the, the, the Weapon X essence of Raphael, our Wolverine, our, 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 our Wolverine-esque turtle. And I want to do something with that, but have it critical to the story, which then we, we use. So Tom really came in and as the overseer of all things turtles in that universe sort of helped shape it and make sure it was it fit in exactly where it needed to as, as we launched into and it became part of a, a great um, element of storytelling uh, or component of the larger picture as, uh, as that series evolved. Um, which is interesting enough, it's, 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 that leads into a, a pretty cool evolution to um, what Tom and I are working on now, which is, uh, um, uh, I'm an archivist to the point of probably, you know, bordering on hoarding. <laughs> um, I save everything, especially, you know, artwork, little scribs and scribbles and things. And, and, um, and I come across a number of years ago, a story that Peter and I wrote in um, 1987. It was set 30 years in the future, which was 2017. And uh, I just loved the, there were certain elements in that story that what Peter and I were thinking, because that was sort of the tail end of, us intimately working together on the uh, on the ongoing comic series before everything licensing and merchandising really sort of took off and, and, and distracted from from so much of that. And so there was this idea that we, I had, or we had, Peter and I had, um, and I showed it to Tom <laughs> at some point um, when I had been noodling around and making some notes on it. And because we've been talking about so many other things that we wanted to, to do together, other, um, you know, things outside the Turtle universe and within the Turtle universe. Um, but when you were looking at sort of what was coming at the end of issue 100, we just felt like um, there was another evolution of something that could be done as a turtle story that could be really awesome, take it to the next level, take it to that original set of fans. Um, and so with this idea, it was sort of, we evolved it. I, I made a bunch of notes on it, say early in 2000, I mean, late 2018 into 19, and we started bantering about it um, pretty regularly. And, and we sort of saw it as, um, we could set in a turtle universe that was not an IDW universe, um, not all the other universes, but it was a turtle universe within itself, but leaned definitely heavily towards um, the Mirage universe in, in every way, shape, and form based on the um, Peter Laird's involvement. And we, you know, I went back to Peter and we had a number of conversations about him coming involved, uh, becoming involved in the story, which he um, gave us his blessing and said, I'm, I'm kind of retired, and uh, but you, Go forth, young men, 
Um, so from that, Tom and I really um, dug deep and in, in dug into uh, um, an idea that started on this thread, my goodness, you know, 30 at that point, <laughs> 2007, it was set like 32 years. It was designed, it was written 32 years ago. And so we really mind melted and this idea became ours um, in every sense of the world. We looked at you know, it being set in the future. We wanted it that we didn't have to pay respects to any particular turtle universe that we sort of, um, what do we call it? Kind of our dark night, Tom, if you will, to yeah. use an, uh, an analogy, um, which was to sort of do the, exactly that, create a universe that was um, all to uh, within itself and do something that was, um, I think this one was, um, I felt like every issue of issue 100 you wrote was written for, for you, Tom Wallace, but I think this one we're writing for ourselves is sort of like, yeah. this is the next evolution of, of... Well, th this is the thing about turtles and this is uh, what, what amazes me the most is, so we, you know, we write a hundred issues and kind of create our own, our own thing for those hundred issues based on something that's been around since the eighties and it's had multiple iterations that are always their own thing, but still the turtles and people are still, you know, both creatively and as fans excited to be a part of it. And so when Sophie Campbell took over with issue 101, our ongoing it kind of has become a new thing that's exciting and fresh. And, and she was a perfect person to take over and, and, and take it to the, in the kind of this new era post 100. And it just shows you how, how even within a 10 year ongoing, it can become fresh and new, but still a, a core turtles uh, story. But then we started working on the Ronin and, and, you know, just by design, just, you know, naturally it's going to, at the beginning, we thought, well, this kind of leans more toward the Mirage universe. That's where it came out of. But as we started changing things, which we had to, because w one of the funniest things is it's a future story, but a future story that was plotted in the eighties. So some of that future stuff we have now, it's not so <laughs> futuristic, which I always say, and I, and I can't wait till people see, you know, some of the stuff later on when the book's published. Yeah. Peter was scary, like Nostradamus and the, some of the things he was predicting because Probably. the problem yeah, stuff. Yeah, it was bizarre. I was like looking at this, I'm like, he's like, he wrote a handbook for, for 2019, 2012, he 2020. A lot of stuff. He invented yeah. a lot of stuff that wasn't invented yet. <laughs> it's bizarre. I, I was like, I was cracking up when I was reading. I was like, this is kind of scary. But the thing is, so obviously we have to kind of futurize it ourselves. And we, you know, one of the things we talk about is Dark Knight. We talk about Blade Runner a lot, kind of dystopian, you know, a future that's not so sci-fi you can't grasp it but it has sci-fi elements and that's what i've always thought about blade runner but the thing is that that as we're working on it again turtles proves it still has stories to tell that this property this brand this this whatever you want to call it this, this just this lightning in a bottle continues to strike and so as we've continued you and i both have come to the realization that this isn't about mirage or idw this is kind of like Dark Knight became its own timeline, its own Turtles universe, which has the potential for us to tell new origins and all kinds of things. So, so once we get through this, I think, you know, hopefully it works as well as we feel it will, and it will, and fans will embrace it. I'm excited. It's, it's again, it's like being at the beginning, which I never thought I'd say ten years later, a hundred issues under my belt. Well, that's what that's what's fascinating is you know you think that you know nine plus almost ten years ago. Um, 2011, we launched the first issue was launched, yep. so, um, but uh, nine years ago, that um, that was fresh and exciting, and, and still, that whole series is, like I said, a, a very definitive Turbo universe to me. But to get excited about something like another universe or taking another place with, you know, all the components that we love so much about any Turtle universe we visit is um, uh, or that you can encapsulate or tell stories within. It's the the heart and soul of the family going back to roots and origins and things that are very specific and and it's um there's a you know um the family aspect which we which we dearly love and, and with this one we we really um pushed with great support also from uh, nickelodeon and everybody else is that we want to make this the you know the, it's going to be the edgiest turtle story that's done that's been done in, in a while but um, um it, it, in that it's it's got some serious teeth and some repercussions and it tells a really good story of, of love and family and uh, resolution and redemption and things that i think fans kind of dig and um and this is actually so we've got a couple cool announcements or some announcements uh, one not so cool one super cool i want to get to is um 
when Tom and I put together the project with everybody's support, um, we chose Andy Kuhn as the uh, series artist, um, kind of the main guy that we wanted to work with for a number of reasons. We've, I've known Andy for a long time. We all have. Uh, we love him dearly. He's been an important part of telling some wonderful turtle stories. Um, and then through, you know, after a year of discussion, then we sort of launched into the series early in this year. Um, due to a lot of scheduling conflicts and personal issues and things, we tried to make it work with Andy as best we could. Um, um, he tried, we know he tried, uh, but it just didn't work out um, with him. And so Andy's going to step away for personal reasons. And um, we've been in discussion with artists to replace Andy um, and, and make the project their own. And so those are ongoing. So we'll announce that soon. But one of the things that we were going to announce at Comic-Con was bringing in our very own, my fellow brother and from Maine, uh, Ben Bishop, you know, veteran of Target R. He survived in the trenches with us already. Um, no, but we have specific sequences that um, uh, Tom and I designed for issues two, three, and four. Because um, again, if you um, don't know the issue. The, the series is designed to be um, five issues, 40 pages each, um, bi-monthly, and we were going to launch, uh, the first issue was supposed to launch and uh, come out in August. It might be a little bit later, I'm guessing, I think we're in September now, Tom? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, yeah. depending on how things go, we're, we're definitely kind of moving into September at this point. Yeah, so um, so we're officially welcoming Ben Bishop. Um, well, now so not welcoming. He knew he's known about it for a while. We haven't been able to talk about it for a while, but Ben is definitely uh, on board for um, some very specific stuff that we uh, uh, developed with him him in mind to do in, in the next three issues. I'm trying to be as as vague as possible for spoiler reasons, um, but super psyched um, finally be able to talk about it a little bit, <laughs> or at least let people know I'm involved. Um, but yeah, I can't wait. Um, it's gonna rock. I don't know what else I could say. Uh, the future, future stuff's awesome. It's totally in my wheelhouse. I love post-apocalyptic, crazy Blade Runner, everything, and I love turtles. So I won't let you down. So. <laughs> oh no, no, we wouldn't. We definitely, we, we certainly wouldn't have chosen you otherwise for sure. But and, and you know, and that's. But it is funny that it's. it's um, well, I'm not you know, we've done, we've done panels. You know, you've been on panels. I've been on panels. We've all been on panels together where we you know, have, have developed a story and have written, you know, three or four issues ahead. And so we already know what's going on. Like we knew what was happening with Jenica, <laughs> you know, months before. And so I'd be at a show or something and, and you just couldn't tell anybody and be like, right. oh, you just want to, you know, so, but you got to. It's for me because like, I want to tell everyone, obviously it's yeah. like big, big deal for me, you know? So um, now once this panel airs, I can, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what do you think? It, it, it's, it's proof too. Again, this story is so different because its roots are third, you know, back in the '80s, and all the foundation was there. But this thing is is evolving daily for both you and I, and and now and with Ben on board and, and whomever the new artist will be, because these these sequences didn't exist when we first started. They didn't, they weren't something we were talking about. But then as we started plotting the story, we said this is there's a, an interesting way to tell this story that we hadn't thought about and it's, it worked out perfect. And it was, it was a great time to say, we need somebody else to come in to help with this part because it, it, it we want this to be a unique book. And it, you know, and like nobody wants to hear about a book being delayed. You know, I work at IDW publishing as a publisher. We don't like things to be delayed, but this one is, this is one, one of those things where we want it to be right from the publisher all the way down to us as the creators you know, and Nickelodeon included in, uh, and I'm sure the retailers ultimately, because this is something I hope, even if this is the only thing we do in this universe, this is something we want to be evergreen. This is something we want to sell forever. And we don't want it to be something that if, 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 you know, excuse my French, we half ass it, then yeah, it'll sell for five months, you know, whatever it's out on the shelves. And then that's it. We don't want it to be that thing. We want this to be a complete package yeah. that, that is something people want to pick up you know when when it's 30 years from now when it's that future and, and, and any of that stuff's true uh we'll see how we'll see how prescient we are for, if we're anything compared to to peter but um you gotta be think, you gotta be proud of the work you do and if, if you want it to last yeah. forever, like you got to do it right um yeah. kevin and i know how that goes with drawing blood <laughs> we'll talk about and, that and, and we'll get it out and so you know and it's it's disappointing but at the same time 
hopefully you take the, the, the news as we're making sure this is the right book before it become it gets out to you know to the printer this has to, it has to be something that comes from our hearts that we know will impact turtles fans when they pick it up and so we'll, we'll get there we're getting there it's it's yeah. too good to not do it the <laughs> done it was it was concocted when i was two years old so it's been <laughs> progress for quite some time as tom and i adjust our depends okay all oh, right well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, actually i was actually i was one years old i had that wrong so <laughs> no i'll just say in, in a that's what's been so amazing about this this story the development of the story in the the totally um, organic path that it sort of where it started and how it evolved when you know tom said quite clearly just a minute ago is that even with the material on hand of what we had and we both had a, a billion ideas and we also almost like at the same time had to sort of say you know well let's we don't want to pull a piece from that universe that we know or a piece even from the idw universe because you could sort of fall into uh, a reference of uh, a nuance of well this happened in issue 66 so we can relate to it here and i was like no no it's a different it's a different universe and so there are things in there that were literally born out of um just discussion and and elimination and excitement because we got so excited we sit and talk about this well this works so let's keep this per let's move this over here and maybe we can use that again and then um the even the writing process because tom's so used to um writing finished scripts and passing on to a, an awesome artist uh, that brings it to life and this one we you know, um, evolve the sequences together. Some sequences, um, so my request was doing uh, large action set pieces. <laughs> it's always, you know, lean out, that lean out of one shot is always my favorite, one of my favorite turtle stories, which was almost, you know, 25 pages of action. And so these large action set pieces, which you want to be um, crafted in a way they don't take away from the story, they enhance the story, they make it part of it. So it's, it's been a, it's a, it's been a growth, um, for both of us because we sort of like we're really sort of literally climbing each other's heads and, and telling something that and then uh, um, and then of course the great uh, the great Peter Laird has helped build the foundation of that because we do look to those originals and like um, the Nostradamus aspect and things when we when we put those out to the fans like it's like the equivalent of like I remember William Shatner did a book years ago where he claimed that Star Trek created most of the <laughs> most of the electronics we use today um, it's similar to that, but I think Peter actually did. So, yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> so, um, yes, last Ronin, um, you know, hang tight, stay tuned. And, and as you know, Tom really summed up wonderfully as like everybody did. We, um, we love this book. It's, we're very passionate about it and we're, we're chest deep in it. And it's going to come out exactly when it should, um, because the time will be right and it's got to be perfect and we want it to be perfect. Um, and so it's worth it to us to, to make sure it is. And so, Stay tuned. It's going to be worth the wait, and um, you know. So, and then you know, what I should mention too. Going back to the to the actual ongoing, um, when we stopped with issue one hundred, um, and I don't want to spoil things for people who haven't read it yet, but there was a pretty major event at the end of that that issue, and so when Sophie Campbell came out issue one hundred one and she took over, we by design had the story jump forward six months from the events of 100, you know, to where 101 starts. So um, there's a gap there, obviously, but we didn't need to deal with that gap. And there was things that needed to be dealt with in the ongoing that, that were, I think, more of an immediate concern for the readers and, and for us creatively. Um, and Sophie's just done a wonderful job of that, taking off from uh, where we left off. However, I did get an opportunity to kind of, you know, dip my feet back into that that universe and we have an annual that we're actually getting ready to send to the printer tomorrow so it's the uh the tmt annual 2020 i'm i'm uh, subtitling it the monsters within and so that that kind of takes place about 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 a month after the events of 100 we're kind of jumping back talking about chronological uh shifts and it gives us a chance to show the fans some of um the repercussions of 100 on characters that they haven't actually seen in, in the ongoing since then. So that includes Shredder, um, the Rat King, uh, Karai and her, her mutants, uh, Angel, who's who's our, our version of Nobody, and Alapex, as well as a special Leatherhead Crane combo. So I'm just gonna leave it at that so I don't spoil for people who haven't read 100, but uh, 
It's uh, coming out. We're sending it to the printer tomorrow. Adam Gorham was the artist. He's so good. So awesome. good. Uh, yeah. It's, and it's, uh, it, I was really happy with the story itself. And it was fun to kind of, like I said, dip my toes back in. And it, it felt weird because that was the first time where I felt like kind of a guest writer. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, funny, it's, like, it's like being, being, a, being in a, a, a guest writer in a world that you built. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was fun. It was fun. And those are characters I love. Um, I think the only person I missed, but, but Sophie's doing a great job with them in the, in the main series, is my favorite character to write is Baxter Stockman by far. He's <laughs> my absolute favorite character to write in all of Turtledom. And I didn't get to write him this time, but I, I got to mention him at least. So there's that. But uh, I'm looking forward to that. And, and I, I really suggest for fans that they want to kind of find out you know, what happened in that, that gap period between 100 and 101, the, the annual fill in some of those blanks. No, I was excited. That was, a, you know, it's 30 pages of awesomeness. So I thought it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, Adam, Adam killed on it. And it, I think it's, right now it's scheduled, I think, last week of July, if all goes well. Uh, it should be in stores, but it'll definitely be around that, around that time period. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Well, I will say that, you know, this is um, super exciting. So I know you um we're all active on Twitter and social media, and um, you can visit cavitysmoothstudios.com and get the latest updates there. Bish, uh, Bish Art Kids, Bish Art. And then yeah, yes, I, I think between the three of us, yeah, yeah. figure it out. We'll, we'll keep you up to date on <laughs> um, everything we can leak, everything we can let you know, and everything on um, the last round. And, and uh, um, be excited because we are, and and we'll get there. It, it, you know, it's just it's a it's a slight hiccup, um, and uh, we're sorry to lose Andy, but you know, it's like the future is ever forward, and, and we'll we'll make it. Uh, it's it's uh, it's going to be perfect. We're not going to have it any other way. It's uh, yeah. all these you know, too many years in the making. So uh, awesome. cool. So I'm not sure what time we're at at this level, um, but I think they they're going to shut us off after six hours. Is that right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, with that, I'm going to say, uh, uh, Tom, love you, brother. Um, I'll be talking yeah. to you probably tomorrow. about Awesome. Uh, Thank you for bringing me in on um, such a monumental book, man. It's going to be great. Oh, yeah. We're happy. All right. So I should, uh, we got to I think I jump out. I, I guess I got to push the button on my end. So, hey, fans. Farewell. Comic Con, we love you. We'll see okay. you guys again soon. We'll get a cold one at the Hilton Bayfront, all right? Let's do it. Next we're, year. <laughs> next year, we'll do that. All right. All right. We're going to bring in a, another surprise guest as yes. Tom exits. Thanks, I hope, Tom. I hope he's ready. That was good. Good so, so far. So good. Here we go. Who is it? Who is it going to be? Could be anybody. <laughs> oh, there he is. Ah, his his hair's growing back. David Avalone. Avalone? Avalone. I say Avalone. It is me. <laughs> it is me. <laughs> Hello, lads. This is the dream team right here. This is Team Drawing Blood. Love you. You know, it's the first thing is we, we, we all talk pretty regularly because we're constantly working on Drawing Blood, but I've, I'm finally seeing David's hair growing back. Yeah, um, yeah, right. he, did, he did the Lex Luthor look. Um, I did early in the year. Uh, now it's kind of a Steve McQueen bullet kind of a thing going on in my dreams. <laughs> By yeah. the way, Facebook just told me yes. July 9th is the anniversary of Drawing Blood. Nice. July 9th, 2015 is when you and I had the first conversation about Drawing Blood together and I came up with the title. I noticed that this morning as well because I always share my memories. Cause right. I a lot, so there's a lot of good memories. That's and right. San Diego to like all chummy at the Bayfront there. Yeah. Yep. That's the that's the picture that came up for me just literally just now while I was waiting to come on the. Well, I'm glad the, you called the panel. I know that. this won't be part of. <laughs> no, it will. San Diego <laughs> Comic Con. No, it won't be playing on July 9th, obviously, but we're recording on July 9th, and that is the. Uh, <laughs> I love that you guys have like your offices and your comic books in the frame, and I've got liquor. I've got my liquor <laughs> just got, uh, right there, so it's not far. <laughs> just, just got a bunch of alcohol. Those, and also, those are all my father's books right there. I love it. Well, it's like you know, it's you know, every good writer has to have their alcohol. Not to have the liquor nearby, and 
and chosen for me by my wife, uh, by my wife, chosen by me for my wife, the, uh, the, the uh, Twin Peaks oh. uh, Black Lodge uh, uh, carpet scheme on the wall there, the, the you know. It's not, it's, not, it's not busy and distracting at all. Don't worry. No, it, it's not great for streaming. You're right. I should. No, it, it, it was closed for uh, air conditioning. We're new to this. Yeah. Well, listen, I wanted to. Uh, this is super exciting, and actually, because that was um, that year was um, Comic Con was earlier that year. Yes, it yeah, was that's why July ninth. That's why it was. It was. It was uh, crazy early comparatively. How many so, years ago was that? That was five years ago. It was 2015. Wow. Yep. I came on board the next year, I think. <clears throat> Four years, or, or two years, maybe. Two years, yeah, because the first year we were developing it as a TV show. Yep. And it took a year, like, to get from that first conversation to yes. a, a show Bible and a script and all that. And then, hi, Courtney. Hi, everybody. Happy Comic Con. Hi, Courtney. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then we decided the next summer after that. So I think summer of 2016, we decided to make it a comic book. Yeah. And I started working on changing the first script into three issues. And sometime after that, that's when we bring Ben into the fold. And then the next, it was like the following Comic Con, we announced it. Yes. At some time where I had to hold it in again. And, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's no, because it, it is interesting because it's like um, it's one of those things that the uh, when the idea started coming together, I feel like it came together very quickly. It's almost like one of those, you know, perfect storms. Like the, you know, David and I mind melding, you know, bringing Ben in, and you know, Troy came in. So it seemed like once it sort of was pointed in the right direction, it came to very came together very quickly. And luckily, um, you know, Ben's experience with um, Kickstarter programs and things like that, we all sort of were like look, let's go back to, at least for me, um, and Ben had already been an independent publisher for many years with his other projects that he'd done, um, right. Nathan the Caveman and uh, The Aggregate, which is where I first discovered his work and those things. Um, uh, go back to self-publishing, which was fantastic. So when we did that first Kickstarter and raised enough money to do the first four issues, plus the the one shot, we call it the one shot, um, the right on. of the original 1991 <laughs> Uh, Shane and Paul Bookman, there it is, yay. <laughs> um, do that book that uh, Troy and I worked on. And that was fantastic. So the fans came out and they supported it. And for us, you're looking at it. This was a creative team. You know, it's like, you know, Dave and I talked about it. David wrote these beautiful scripts. Um, ben then, you know, brought to life in his artwork in a way that not only his main um, storytelling for each of the, you know, the, the largest part of each of the comic books, then with the um, uh, with the flashbacks that Ben would pencil in that ink, and then these hallucination scenes that we'd come up with that uh, Ben would pencil and Troy would do would finish. It was just hilarious. But we were the guys in control, and that was that true independent independent spirit that is just a, has been the greatest gift. Which is funny because um, we did the celebration. So the 2017 raise was the first one. We did the celebration of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's from the panel where Kevin gave me his name and it says for ben the day our worlds changed forever yep so cool like <laughs> that's great somebody asked me for that after the show i was like i'm sorry i'm keeping it <laughs> <laughs> sure it all started at san diego in multiple ways i mean you guys got together at san diego um we launched oh, yeah. in san diego announced it yeah, yeah. no it, it's been it's been very san diego centric mm -hmm. kevin and i met for the very first time at emerald city Oh, okay. And saw each other a bunch of times at uh, around the IDW offices after that. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, in between. But yeah, we met in March and it's July. That's only, what, three, four months later. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we started. It seems like it was a longer time than that, but it really <laughs> wasn't. It really was just March 2015 to July 2015 that we started working together. I think it's and I don't know if you guys have told everybody, but you know, one of the reasons, at least I'm going to say, one of the reasons that we've been slow on drawing blood book two is we've been putting a lot of time and energy, all three of us, 
into the development of Drawing Blood as a TV show again. So the thing has come all the way around, yes. back to where we started. Um, it's open. But I think it's, it's, it's crucial to say this because I think a lot of, uh, after what happened with Drawing Blood, a lot of my screenwriting pals and TV pals were like, so should I turn my script into a graphic novel? Is that the way to go? And I always said, Kevin and I did it because we love comic books and we're comic book guys. And you do not want to spend six months of your life and a bunch of money on a brochure for a TV show. Like if that's what you want to do, make a brochure, don't make a comic book. Um, And, you know, and I think it, it gives us one of the things that comes from Kevin starting with self publishing and it's a great thing to have in a career as an artist is you've never really had to say yes to things that you didn't want to say yes to. And because we were willing to, because we love drawing blood as a comic book, we've never had to compromise like so far so good on this latest round with the TV show and we'll see where it goes. But I love that. We, we, I, I love seeing you excited um, when the book came out and you were like, this is my first self-published book. And oh, yeah. It feels so damn good. When I started self-publishing, like a lot of people look at that as like, oh, you haven't, you know, you haven't made it to publishing yet. And it's like, no, like I'm good. Like, like right. all, that, all that is extra. Like that's great. And it's going to bring more people that know about whatever I'm yeah. doing. And like, there's nothing well, more fun than being your own boss and going, this is how we want the book to be. We're going to make oh, yeah. it right. We're going to do it however we want to do it. And I can honestly say that my work with Kevin Eastman Studios, my work on Drawing Blood, pays me a lot better than my real work has ever paid me. So, you know, that there's that irony too. I'm able to, you know, we're able to pay ourselves living rates that we can be happy with. No, it's like, you know, that goes back That's to- not always what the comic book industry is going to offer you, is a good rate that you can be happy with. Yeah, you're so true. It's so true because he, he does. It goes back to, uh, you know, the, the fans that supported it because then, you know, it's just, I was thinking like we're talking about a potential for a Drawing Blood TV show. Um, so if, if we pitch it and it goes ahead, we just have to remind the producers it has to come out by Comic-Con 2021 <laughs> because, you know, um, we, met, <laughs> we met in the 2015. Yep. Uh, we launched the Kickstarter in 2017 all at San Diego Comic-Con. Um, celebrated their release uh, uh, in, uh, in 2018. 2019, we launched a second Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, we always have something to talk about at Comic Con. Yeah, and we're and we're we're rounding. I'd say rounding second, sliding into third on. Uh, Here's on one. drawing blood number two. All those pages on the wall there. Yeah, yep. <laughs> there it is. If you can zoom all the way in, you could see <laughs> yeah. what's going on. Uh, but not really, but yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I don't know if you guys have talked about it before I came in, but I'm super happy with, uh, with where book two is gone. It's, a, uh, it's even more intense. It's even, it's super personal, uh, in a way. And it always feels like such a pleasure. I love drawing, I love writing mainstream comic books. Not that I've written such mainstream, I wouldn't, you know, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark ain't Batman. Like there's mainstream and then there's mainstream. What? But there's something pretty nice about writing a comic book that's very much, as much as, as much as our lives in comic books and show business are real lives, it's nice to write a comic book that's about real lives, that's about, reality that we can talk about personal things that mean something to us and of course like all writers like all artists you put that stuff in elvira mistress of the dark you put that stuff in the aggregate you put it in the turtles there's always stuff that reflects your real life which is always kind of funny uh but in something like this it's way more close to the bone in terms of lived human experience uh and also for the fans out there, it's got at least 30% more sex than book one. So that's, you know, that's, that's good. That's <laughs> you long read it. No, I think- um, yeah, issue, si- issue six is the, is the sex issue. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I think uh, what, what I find fascinating um, 
as this project has developed and, and evolved because it is a um, um, you know we we had sketched out you know the the, the landscape uh, generally the players um, the idea of where it was going to go what we wanted to say with it and sort of sort of pared that down to a 12 issue series which again you know the first four thanks to you fans um, supported um, uh, the next four um, uh, which I can't wait till you see what Troy Little did with the Turtles Adventures series based on the radically mm -hmm. rearing on a rank else animated series. His 40 part giant size is going to make you fall off your chair laughing. But it feels like um, each of these elements in this forward, when as we look towards the final chapters, um, once we get past these, is um, it's been organic in the way that there are personal things that I put in there, a lot of personal things that David put in there. But you know, what Ben has brought to the table in so many ways is the same. It's like his visual experiences, what he's doing to bring those characters to life and stuff that he creates a navigation beyond the script and brings these things to level. level. It's really, it's three very personal, uh, it's an involvement of all three of us to make this this, uh, this series really work the way that it does. And it's, you know, I, I like, Ben will turn in another page and I just, you know, swear word, swear word, swear word, swear word, you know, brilliant. Um, um, and I know what David's working on next on um, chapter seven for the main event and then where we want to go with, with eight, which has sort of been planning, but it's still like the plan has been a paragraph or two of that issue and then watching it sort of, it's really, you know, they float out of David's it, mind. And it's out funny of that, that issue six takes place around the corner from where I live and issue seven takes place around the corner from where Ben lives, essentially. <laughs> Like it, I didn't plan it that way or think about it that way, but you know. I'm glad it's easier for well, me to get reference around. Oh here. yeah, yeah. There's literally there's there, there's a scene by a riverside, and I'm like, you can look out your window and draw that. I think from your studio. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know both in in both issue six and issue even seven. I think, especially, I think that's where you know, like David just said, um, there were certain elements in there that we talked about of like this setting and that setting that he then went and got reference and sent to Ben that was places right down the street from where he lives. And then when Ben is going to be doing the, the uh, issue in Maine, there's stuff in there that's definitely, there's going to be, um, I guess I don't know if you call it Easter eggs, but there's definitely some super cool little yeah. things. Cause there's always something in each of those issues that sort of is. A yeah. Thing. Yeah. Like, so this isn't very spoilery, but I, I had David go out was walking around his neighborhood because he wrote the story around his neighborhood and he took the exact photos we needed um yeah. as far as for me to know like what does that part of los angeles look like um you know with the hollywood sign in the distance and stuff like i couldn't make that up and anyone who's reading it who has been there uh more often than me would know if i did um right um, and i'm alluding to it like we're not we're at the end of the issue and i know where the next one's going which is maine <laughs> And so I've got him wearing like the Portland Sea Dogs shirt the whole time. <laughs> he's also in LA, so he's t-shirt weather where books is usually, you know, long sleeves and suspenders and stuff. And so I've got this whole new LA look for books and it's like <laughs> for fun for me. Like he's got sunglasses and he's not, he's not in shorts territory unless he's at the pool. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's a ton of fun to bring him to different places. Like him and Beasley, especially if you read the book, there's a character who's not anything like uh, Simon Beasley uh, named Nigel Beasley. Um, and, and they're in LA together and they both have like their LA looks. And it's just like so cool to see them in a different environment. I love that stuff. Yeah. You know, and Kevin, how did, like, I feel like I had chosen the hotel that they were going to stay at. And then you suggested the same hotel before I, I told you that. I was like, yeah, he's going to be staying at some motel in Hollywood. And you were like, oh, how about the Coral Sands? I was like, I was going to use the Coral Sands because it's such a, and the cor it's getting torn down now. Or, or, or we'll see if the scaffolding goes away. Maybe they're I was looking up reference and it was all like, it's going to be gone. It's going to be gone. I'm like, yeah, I got to take, take screenshots. It's, a, it's, a, it's such a classic. My wife mentioned it to me because uh, there was a burlesque show she used to be a part of called Brick Tops. Mm -hmm. And I feel like once a year, the producer of Brick Tops would rent the, like the entire Coral Sands and have a crazy. Uh, so it's got a, that one's got a long storied crazy ass history in Hollywood. I and I know. love including stuff like that. I hope people who know it recognize it. I know in issue four, 
or actually no, that was in this issue, I think. We go to a a, a specific bar that's very famous as well. Oh yeah. Movies and whatnot. And I think anyone who knows the bar will recognize it. And I think oh, yeah. we're doing oh, a, yeah. a fictional true story, so there's there's real places in it. Yeah, and it just I you know, I do I believe in this for everything I work on. Every minute an artist has to spend looking up references a minute they're not drawing. So I would always much rather like, here it is. Here's the, here's the room I was thinking about. Here's every angle of it that I can think of. Yeah, I think uh, for that bar scene, I was like, you gotta go there and you gotta go there when there's no people there. Yeah. And I said, and if there is a couple people there, like I need their scale, like da da da. Yeah. And then I just drew it. <laughs> Yeah. Like I got reference for you, and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> like I figured it out. But you had found you had found pictures online. I think of the I Dresden's. Uh, I was website. A lot of the movies that had that bar in it. Um, yeah. and just using it for aesthetics. Like, okay, there's a rock wall over here, hanging lights, yada yada. Um, yeah. And whatnot, but um, that's that's part of the fun when we're not too strict about it, but we're close enough that, and that's how I feel like the whole story yeah. is like a fictionalized true story. It's like. Where can we have fun with it, but also include the things that really happened and are in reality to tie it to things that actually exist? And look, people who live in Los Angeles, all we do is recognize restaurants we've eaten in when they show up on television shows. <laughs> like, that's like the number one thing is, oh, they're having, oh, yeah. I don't know what we were, I don't know what we were watching the other day. It might have even been Doom Patrol or something like that. We're like, oh, they're in uh, Muscle Franks again. Great. Yeah, that's, uh, I noticed that, like, uh, we watched, um, Courtney and I watched the uh, TV series Hollywood? Hollywood. Hollywood? Yeah, there was one called Hollywood. Yeah, but it's, um, yeah, it's a um, on, new ongoing series that they launched. It was totally b bizarre, you know, but wonderful period piece where they just sort of take these incredible liberties and stuff. But I saw, you know, Musso and Franks, I think, you know, shot from different angles, being in different places. I saw the dress, yes. you know, several times. <laughs> that, was so that was one of the, that was one of the things that cracked me up on Mad Men, is the first six seasons, they're in New York, and they're constantly using Los Angeles, and it shoots in Los Angeles. They're constantly using landmark LA restaurants that still look the way they did in the 60s as New York restaurants. And then Don Draper goes to LA and they're like, oh, now he actually has to be at Musso Frank's in the Dresden room. <laughs> like, now we have to use them for what they actually are because I think he's actually supposed to be in LA. I think we talked about that because Don Draper has his New York look, same way Shane Bookman does. Yeah. He goes to LA and it's still Don Draper, but it's his LA look. And we were doing that, we're doing that with Shane in this volume two, which were- No, it's nice, it's nice to get the story out of New York visually and oh, to do a little bit of a tour of the country. And the, color, and, you know, the colors are really gonna sell it too when we start using those different palettes and it's gonna be fun. Yep. So I just wanna do a double check on our time. I have not been tracking us. Um, we're like at an hour, so we're pretty long. Um, an hour, yeah, I think they wanna try to keep us between 45 minutes and an hour. So why don't we do, I was gonna do some questions and some other things, but I think what we should do, and I could, I could say this in here and now is like, how about if we do, um, I'm trying to think of something we can do teaser wise on Drawing Blood, like maybe release half of issue five or something. We can all do like a Facebook Live and get on and talk about that. And we can talk about some other things. But I think there's some other stuff as we're doing, um, heading towards the, rounding the bedding, heading towards the end of um, uh, Drawing Blood volume two, um, which is so awesome. And, uh, um, and I think this would be some great stuff we could share and sort of sort of bump that up um, and have some fun with the fans. Where would you like to share that? What's that? Where would you like to share that so we can tell people to look for it? Your Facebook page? Or yeah, I think, you know, you, know, you know, I know I'm the king of social media. I know you guys dabble in it a little bit. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I know you guys are so active and so on top of the stuff. We do, you know, I do as much as I can do. Um, uh, whatever short attention span. But um, Kevin Eastman Studios is the best place to find out what we're doing, when we're doing it, where we're doing it, um, which is um, great with us. Many events or uh, different stuff we're doing over there at the studio and just uh, the latest and the greatest updates because uh, there's always some fun stuff. And like I said, David and Ben are all over the place. So, you know, uh, you see them a lot more than even you see me. <laughs> and um, nothing else uh, at Drawing Blood Comic on Facebook and Instagram. It's the same. So, well, if we can release release some issue five, we'll do it in those two places for sure. So be on the lookout.
Cool. So I think, you know, with that, I got to, I guess, you know, when I started off the, you know, the session, it was one of those things is, you know, stating the painfully obvious fact that we'd all like to be with you in person dearly and desperately. Um, we appreciate all the support and all the love you give us to not only, uh, um, you know, sponsoring some of the stuff we do, buying some of the products we have for sale, just looking after the other work, whether it's um, some of David's work with Dynamite and Ben's uh, personal individual work with uh, the aggregate and other things that he's doing. Um, but the turtle stuff is ongoing. And, you know, this, this team of the three amigos, um, you know, we say the three amigos and Troy. Um, no, <laughs> no, we always talk about it. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, we want to wish you a um, very happy San Diego Comic Con. Again, love nothing more to be with you live and in person. And um, we look forward to uh, um, hearing you've had a safe um, remainder of 2020. And hopefully, 2021, we're going to be back together again safely and happily and we'll be going over the trailer of the drawing blood um series on that's right the drawing blood tv series we'll okay. all be wearing gemini one space suits like they'd be a big <laughs> oh, wow. but no it, uh, we'll be you going right now you want a tv show or a movie or anything game everything <laughs> <laughs> underwear the uh the, the the drawing blood um theme park ride yeah. to natural i don't so, know on a ride that was called drawing blood <laughs> yeah. Um, so that we want to send uh, uh, love and prayers and best wishes to you all. We want to thank San Diego Comic Con again for uh, um, all they've done for all of us all these years um, and appreciate it and let us um, have a, a, a little hour to chat with you and catch up, catch up with you and give you a little bit of interesting news, we hope. And uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. Calabanga, cool beans. We are Calabanga, cool. indeed. Adios. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.